welcome to our virtual Six Bridges Book Festival. I'm Garbo Hearn, your moderator for the evening, and we're so glad you're here. You're in for a real treat. But before I introduce our guest authors, let's get the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, we have two authors, as you can see, and we want you to hold your questions and put them in the Q&A instead of the chat box. That way, it'll be easier for me to keep up with. And also, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce both authors. They're going to make their presentations, and we're going to do the Q&A after they both make their presentations. Okay? And I make, I'll make sure I get to all of your questions. So I'd like to start by giving a big thank you to all of the sponsors for the Six Bridges Book Festival. But tonight, the special sponsors are, uh, I have them right here in front of me. The Arkansas State Library and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So thank you for sponsoring this evening's event. And as we move forward, now on to the main event. Our first author is Afia Atakar. Did I get it right? You did, Garvey. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> she held, she has a dual citizenship of the UK and the US, and she spent a little time in the UK, a little time in the US, but a lot of time in New York City. So definitely she brings a lot to the table and her debut novel, Conjure Woman, has been hailed as one of the most lyrical, poetic, and I, I should go on, but I won't, but I'm so excited to have you here. Welcome to Arkansas Virtual Style. Oh, thank All right. you for having me. So excited yes. to actually be in Arkansas. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so like Garbo said, um, this is my debut novel, um, and just like everything this year, it is a crazy time to <laughs> have a debut novel out and sort of uh, get to live out a dream virtually, um, but I'm so glad that I have opportunities like this to sort of reach audiences that I don't think I would have had, had the chance to otherwise, so thank you so much. Nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop Nothing. us. Um, I feel, you know what? Part. part of the thing is, I think the way that we've all sort of adapted and found ways to, to sort of still do these important things is, is it's, it, it ties into the novel. We'll get to it. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get so to next, it. I'd like to introduce Stephanie's story. So she is sheltering in place in LA. So. I'm sheltering in place in Hot Springs, Arkansas, right next to Lake Hamilton. I've lived in Los Angeles what? for almost 20 years. Oh but we were traveling full time. We were traveling okay. full time uh, when the pandemic hit. So we are right here in on Lake Arkansas. Hamilton, an oh, hour wow. from Little Rock. Well, hey, well, I'm glad to hear that because I also know in your spare time, you're a television producer. So I figure you're hot shotting all over the place, but you're in Hot Springs, so I'm glad you're here. Now your novel, Raphael, Painter in Rome, came in, oh yeah, I want to share it. Ooh. It's published in April of 2020, and this one, you definitely have, a, have to have a computer or a Kindle so you can go through the journey literally with her visually. So, no further ado, let's go forward with Afia, and I'm going to show her book. Yeah, here you go. Yay! All right. Okay. Sure. Um, so, as I said, Conjure Women just came out um, in April during during the height of the crazy. <laughs> so, for those who didn't catch it, um, I just want to give a little introduction to what it's about. Um, so, I wrote Conjure Women. Um, I tell it sort of through a, a tight narrative braid of uh, the past and the present. Um, the past being called slavery time and the present called freedom time. And so it tells a story of the years just before and just after uh, the Civil War. Um, and the main character is Rue. She's a young midwife and healer. And she lives in a sort of um, imaginary, sort of magical town uh, in the South, unnamed, um, made up of recently freed slaves. And so for me, something I was really interested in and in looking into this time period was um, the Reconstruction era. So that's sort of the 10 year period um, after the Civil War, um, when freedom was sort of uh, bandied about. It was, it was 
handed out and yet there was no plan, there was no way forward. And so I really wanted to explore sort of the psychological um, aspects of suddenly going from being an enslaved person to being a free person and how do you sort of define um, who you are and what your community is. And it's sort of this really complicated time in, in US history because again, there was sort of this discussion of who are these people? How do they become citizens? Um, can they vote? What rights do they have? What rights are, is the ruling class willing to let them have? And so I really wanted to explore that <laughs> to the fullest and it's a chunky book. So I get to sort of um, expand on that. But as I was writing, I sort of discovered that even though I wanted to tell the story of this decade strictly, I realized there was no way to sort of reckon with with this present um, without sort of going back to the past. And that's where the, the braid came in. Um, so again, we meet Rue. She's a midwife in this sort of isolated town. And she's sort of tasked with birthing children, with um, taking care of the sick, um, the elderly. And she sort of has a protective um, spell over the town, um, a sort of they're sort of convinced that she has a legacy that is keeping them protected and isolated um, from the rest of the world. Um, but we also meet Rue's mother, who was the midwife uh, on the plantation during slavery before her. And, and Rue sort of lives in her mother's shadow. And so a lot of the story is her sort of reconciling um, the world that her mother raised her in that is not the world that she finds herself in. Um, we also meet Rue's childhood friend, Verena, who is the daughter of the master on the plantation. And so their coming of age and their friendship is a big part of the story and just discovering the kinds of women that they're gonna be, again, in this world that is changing uh, in definition. Um, and then in the present, so <laughs> in freedom time, Rue reckons with sort of that history and she also is faced with three events. Um, the birth of a strange child with black eyes, uh, the arrival of a charismatic preacher who's sort of bringing um, the new revival religion to the plantation or to the former plantation rather, and also a mysterious sickness, um, sounds familiar, that is sweeping through the town that uh, as, as people sort of begin to fear and begin to worry about, about their safety, they begin to blame Rue for um, the mysterious arrival of this sickness. And so, it's, it's a story about survival and, and how you adapt and, and magic and, and joy and sadness and loss. Um, and I wanted to give you guys a little reading, a little taste, spoiler free, I promise. Um, but hopefully it'll whet your appetite for it. <laughs> so I'm going to read for the end, from almost the end, um, but I promise no spoilers. Uh, so this section is called In the Beginning. There was the ship hold, the early swirling motion of the sea, sickening, the heat of fever, the heat of fear, the only thing cold, the new chains, and even those warmed quick and rusted over with rubbing, with sores, with blood, with futile struggle. The darkness, the void of that black ship bottom, the darkness on the face of the deep, and then someone said unto them, let there be light, piercing light. Did you know light could hurt so bad? On the deck above, they were made to dance under that brightness. So much light, the light of the heavens and also the light of the heavens reflected on the sea. And then a few black bodies that got somehow free of the dance went jumping into that sea, blind, perhaps confusing the sea they'd never seen before for heaven, God's face in the waters. Waste that, false prophets. The rest of them were sent back to the dark void till the ship reached firmament. She had no words for then. They hadn't given them to her yet. But if she fought back and tried to give words to the memories of the ship and after, there was the one that had rung out when they'd stood her up before the curious white faces and made her hold out her arms and then hold open her mouth and then hold open her legs, sold. And was a mama the warm body that made you in a time and a place and a land you couldn't remember? Or was a mama what you made for yourself, the good warm body, the first kind memory of the older woman who slept beside you in the hayloft, who let you fold into her warmth that first evening that you were owned? And she hummed to you because she couldn't speak what you spoke 
and that first sense of love, the earth still for the first time beneath your back, and for the first time through an opening in the roof, the evening sky. You can make dew of unspoken kindness and the stars also. There were signs and seasons and days and years. After a time, she was called Dorothea, named in the mistress's own image. They whooped the name into her, but it couldn't stick right. No, she could say, and then Doe for the rhyme. In the end, they tied the two together, called her Doe, and it was good. So that's a little preview of one of the character's stories. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I really wanted to explore these voices, um, these sort of interiorities, I think, with slave narratives and with this time in our history, we sort of, um, we focus on, on the physical violence um, and the physical sort of representations. And I really wanted to get into the minds of these characters and sort of um, bring them in their flaws and, and in their strengths into sort of a humanity that we could, we could access and start to understand. So it's a little preview of Conjure Women. <laughs> thank you, Althea. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I think Avi is like a poet. That was beautiful. It was a thank lovely you. reading. I have not had a chance to read your book yet, but I'm hooked. So <laughs> thank you for the reading. Um, okay. Okay. Now I'll move on to, 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 to mine, but yours is lovely and I can't wait to hear more. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm actually going to share my screen a little bit for you guys at home on and off because we're going to have some pictures. Because uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm an art historical novelist. So I write about the history of, of art in our world. So I think as we all know, the Sistine Chapel ceiling is painted by Michelangelo between the years of 1508 and 1512, uh, is one of arguably the most iconic works of, work of art in all of Western history, right? And thanks to like the Charlton Heston Rex Harrison movie, right, The Agony and the Ecstasy, which, um, you know that famous movie, and it was based on the uh, a, a portion of Irving Stone's biographical novel about Michelangelo of the same name, The Agony and the Ecstasy. We all know Michelangelo's agony painting that Sistine. We've all heard the story, right? How he, he, he hated to paint and he just wanted to return to his beloved marble. Oh, how he had to lay on his back for four years to paint that ceiling how he had to go up against the, uh, the, the, the temperamental Pope, Pope Julius II, played by Rex Harrison in the movie, right? We all love that story because Michelangelo managed to overcome insurmountable obstacles to create a masterpiece that we all know and love today in the Sistine. But my question is, what if the story as we all think we know it is it really quite as it seems? What if Michelangelo did not indeed have to lie on his back to paint that ceiling? Sorry, kids, he wrote poetry describing the fact that he was standing on his feet, uh, back bowed backwards, and he drew a little sketch of himself painting. This is Michelangelo's sketch of himself drawing, the, I mean, painting the Sistine ceiling. This is a little sketch of God, I guess. I don't know, his little cartoonish God. But this is him, arms stretching overhead, head tilted back, standing on his feet. And what if we could see this story of the creation of the Sistine, not through the eyes of Michelangelo, but through the eyes of his fiercest rival, an artist who was just down the hall while Michelangelo was painting the Sistine, he was decorating the Pope's private apartments. This is the young, brilliant, beautiful painter of perfection, Raphael. These are, by the way, two self-portraits of Raphael. Uh, the one on the left, this one painted when he was in his early 20s. This one uh, on the right, painted about a year before he died when he was just 37. So telling the story of the Sistine through the eyes of Michelangelo's rival is what I set out to do in my newest historical novel, Raphael, Painter in Rome. 
in which Raphael is going to sit like across a tavern table from you and tell you his version of events as he went head to head with Michelangelo. So I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to read you the prologue to give you an idea of what this is like. Okay, so prologue, Rome, March 1520. Why does Michelangelo always get to be the hero? A struggling sculptor, not trained in the art of fresco, forced by a temperamental pope to abandon his precious marble and paint a wretched ceiling, overcomes agony and obstacles to create a divine masterpiece. Si certo, you're moved by the story. I'm moved by it. But you don't honestly believe that he painted that ceiling while lying on his back, do you? How would he have crawled in and out, his body only an arm length from the ceiling without smearing the paint all the time? And how would he have moved, wriggled about on his shoulder blades and hindquarters? Okay, perhaps once or twice, when he was up against a particularly steep curve of a spandrel, he had no choice but to lie on his back for a few moments. But let's bury the myth right now. Michelangelo painted, like the rest of us, standing up. Don't believe me? Look at his own drawings. He sketched himself painting that ceiling, head tilted back, arms stretching overhead, standing on his feet. So no, Michelangelo was not some subjugated hero forced to lie on his back by an intransigent pope. I'm not mad at him for the story. I only wish I'd thought of it. And tell me, per favore, that you don't believe that he hates to paint? Oh, yes, he repeats the lie oft as the Nicene Creed, but that doesn't make it true. It, during the four years, when he was painting the Sistine, not carving any marble at all, he still insisted on signing all of his letters. Michelangelo, sculpt in Rome, as though he hates to paint so much that he is incapable of calling himself a painter. But if you ever walked in to the Sistine on a, a, a quiet Tuesday morning and looked up at those colors, Santa Madonna, those colors, I mean, were you moved to tears too? Now tell me he could have painted such a thing while hating it. I mean, is that what you tell your children? Find something you hate, force yourself to do it, and echo a masterpiece. I know what people say about me. They say Raphael Santi of Urbino is the ideal courtier. Polite, generous, humble. They say I was born with such happy countenance that nothing ruffles me. They say my good looks reflect the beauty on the inside. They say my talent comes easily. They say everything comes easily but don't strip me of my humanity because I'm good at playing a part. You do it too, I'll wager. Put on a smile sometimes, even when you're feeling foul, so don't deny me those same basic human talents. In real life, no one could be as generous and loyal and charming as I pretend to be. No one. You imagine me, if you imagine me at all, the way he describes me, don't you? Standing in the background, easy to forget, an easy rival to vanquish. When I look back on those years, I picture the events the way he tells them too. Him in the center, me in the corner. Oh, Maria Virgin, that's what I do, isn't it? All he does is make himself the hero of his own story. Can I blame him for that? But why do I insist on making him the hero of mine? 
How can I expect anyone else to say, I'm the greatest painter in history if I can't say so myself? Is there a version in which I get to be the hero? Or does he end the victor every time? Okay, that's the prologue. And that's what this is. This is Raphael's version of Michelangelo up the Sistine painting the ceiling while he's down the hall decorating the Pope's private apartments. And this is his attempt to make himself the hero of his own story. Now, those of you who read my debut, I was here with, with, with the Six Bridges Festival uh, when it came out, will be sitting at home going, but wait, she loves Michelangelo. My debut was about the rivalry between Michelangelo and Leonardo. And it's true, I'm obsessed with Michelangelo. I, I've, I've crawled in the backs of library stacks to read everything ever written about him. I've been on a pilgrimage to see every Michelangelo ever put on public display. So if I love Michelangelo so much, how is it possible that I was going to hand the reins of my new novel over to Michelangelo's fiercest, most hated rival? Well, I will tell you, it worked out at least well that I uh, have always loved Raphael's art. Even when I was a kid, I recognized this thing. I think a lot of you will too. It's his most famous pooty, right? We all know them. They're on coffee cups and throw pillows and Christmas ornaments. I did not know, however, when I was young that they come from a larger painting called the Sistine Madonna. They are actually a small portion of this larger altarpiece. But I love this piece. I love these guys. They always captured my imagination. But frankly, I didn't even know they were by an artist by the name of Raphael. The only thing I knew when I was a kid about Raphael came from, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, this is it. This is all I got. So, <laughs> but then I went to college at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, where I got my undergraduate degree in, in art history. And I studied art in Italy. And that's where I was first introduced to the real artist, Raphael Sanzio da Urbino or Raphael Santi. You know, Raphael was considered one of the triumvirate of Renaissance art, along with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. But for hundreds of years after their deaths, Raphael was arguably more famous than the other two. It was Raphael who was held up as the, as the standard to which all other artists should strive. When you think of an ideal painting in your head, you know, like Western art, height of Italian Renaissance, that thing, you are thinking for better or for worse, whether you know it or not, you're thinking of Raphael's or at least Raphael-esque qualities. Same as Shakespeare, for better or for worse, gave us our cliches in literature. Raphael gave us our cliches in our visual language. But even though I have always loved Raphael's art and respected it, I always had a problem relating to the person. Because according to my history books, Raphael was as perfect as his paintings. He was handsome and charming and generous and humble, and those all sound like really great qualities until you roll them up into a single extraordinarily talented human being and then they become really annoying. You know, I don't, I don't like perfect people. I don't like my people and I certainly don't like my artists to be perfect. I want them to be as messy and crazy as I am. So I didn't blame Michelangelo for being a bit annoyed by the perfect Raphael. I agreed with him. And just when I was thinking that, that's when I sat down at, oh, it was at a coffee shop in uh, San Diego, right by the beach. And that prologue that I read to you poured out of me. That prologue in which Raphael insists I am not as perfect as my paintings. That prologue in which his voice does not sound stilted and archaic. It sounds modern as it should because Raphael during his lifetime was one of the most modern artists on the planet. In his own head, he sounded modern. He didn't sound stilted and archaic. And he sat down casually, as if across from a tavern table with me over a beer to just tell me how things really were. And I loved it. And I was like, oh, I get it. No one is as perfect as a Raphael, 
And that's when I realized that all of his so-called perfection was covering up his pain. Raphael was orphaned when he was a kid. His mom and his sister died when he was eight. His dad died when he was 11. He went through the rest of his life without any immediate family. He had an uncle and his father's old assistant. He lived a short, brilliant, difficult life on the Italian peninsula when French armies were marching up and down and invading cities and there were military sieges and there were plagues, which we all seem to know more about these days, unfortunately. And uh, on April 6th, 1520, 500 years ago this year, Raphael died at the age of 37. According to his earliest biographer, from a particularly uh, exhaustive bout of lovemaking. And when you reread that early biography with a little bit of a different perspective, you don't see a perfect courtier. You see a guy who's indulgent, who has maybe a sex addiction, who, who, who plays a lot, who is beloved. He's more like a modern day rock star. And when you spend just a little bit of time with Raphael's drawings with this new perspective in mind, you don't see someone who is too perfect to be loved. You start to see hints of what we today might diagnose as OCD. He repeats figures. He is overly perfecting of every single line. He captures every detail and redoes it and redoes it and redoes it until it's perfect. When my novel begins, Raphael's father is dying and he makes the 11 year old Raphael promise he will become the greatest painter in all of history. The primary plot of my novel uh, focuses on Raphael's quest to keep this deathbed promise to his father by going up against, chasing, and maybe even surpassing a guy by the name of Michelangelo as they go head to head in the halls of the Vatican while popes conspire and armies go to war and cardinals kill dukes and wolves rule the ruins of Renaissance Rome. But amidst all this plot, you know, because I like plot. Um, my real point is that Raphael was not perfect. He was just desperate to cover up all of his brokenness by painting picture after picture after picture of perfection, determined that no matter how difficult life was, that he would always try to bend the world toward beauty. And that's my little novel. Well, thank you both for those inspiring opportunities to learn more about your books. And I know those of you that are on the chat, on the, are gonna go run out and read the book immediately. So we're gonna start with some questions uh, that Melissa McCauley has for Afi. She says she's read about various African-American towns formed after the Civil War, and was a location inspired by any of them in particular? No, so that's a good question, thank you. Um, no, there wasn't one in particular. Sorry, am I echoing? No, okay. <laughs> uh, no, there wasn't, there wasn't one location in particular. Um, for me, I think, I really wanted to sort of make a composite um, sort of town that didn't exist in, in the strict history and was sort of about the possibilities, right? About, about um, expectations. And so I really didn't want it to hinge on the facts of any one place, um, but be more sort of an exploration of the sort of psychological, what, what um, I thought would be borne out by these people. Um, and then I did sort of grab little bits of history. I think someone in the chat mentioned uh, the Works Project Administration, which was a huge influence um, in me sort of creating this town. But again, it was a composite. It was, um, it was, it's, it's meant to sort of um, emulate many towns. So I did everything I could to sort of include um, little bits of Texas, little bits of Arkansas, little bits of um, Georgia. Um, and sort of go out of my way to, to create that sort of southern um, energy without without hinging on any one particular place. Well, Melissa also has two other questions, and 
She wants to know, Althea, do you have a medical background? She says she went down the rabbit hole reading about various forms of ichthyosis. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Trying to figure it out. And also she wanted to know, was the sickness type um, so firstly, I do not have medical background to the chagrin of my mother, <laughs> um, but my mom was a nurse and she was a home health aide while I was growing up. Um, so I've always sort of, and, and that sort of figures into the novel because uh, Rue observes her mother um, as a midwife and treating people in the town. And so that really informed uh, me writing Rue's coming of age, but I personally um, do not have <laughs> a medical background, although I should. Um, but I'm just a, a sort of obsessive historical and weird medical fact person. Um, and that sort of definitely inspired the novel. Um, and then the other question, uh, typhus and ichthyosis. Um, I, again, in, in the similar vein of creating the town, didn't want to hinge um, any of the diseases on real things um, without giving any spoilers away. I, um, I will say that the water is a big um, component of the illness that goes through the town um, and sort of the uh, baptism is a, is a huge part of, river baptism is a huge part of the novel and so um, water diseases sort of inspired that. And as far as ichthyosis, um, in the case of Bean, who again is the child of the black eyes, um, that definitely inspired it. I didn't want to again hinge on that, but I did want to sort of create a, a child that didn't have any um, symptoms, any physical symptoms, but has sort of had an appearance um, that people could project their their opinions on. And so the book is very much about appearance and, and skin type and skin color. And so I, I work to sort of create sort of an imaginary illness that people can sort of um, have conjectures about without it, without it ever being clear. And again, for those people who don't have, you know, the, the wealth of knowledge that we have today, they really didn't know what they were dealing with, um, which is all too familiar again, <laughs> as we keep saying. And so that's something I wanted to explore as well. So Shannon Lausch says, Afia, she's in the middle of reading your book and she absolutely loves it. And as an archivist, she's always curious about the historical resources that authors use. She notes in your author's note, I learned that you use the slave narratives, interviews of former slaves conducted by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s, as well as the stories from your grandmother to inspire you. Could you talk more about this? Yeah, so um, I love, I always bring up the WPA, and um, those were uh, slave narrative interviews during, done during the 1930s um, of former slaves who were um, in their 80s and 90s at this point, um, who were sort of recounting their memories of slavery um, in this very complex sort of interview, you know, done by the government. So, <laughs> you know, as we're all doing the census, I think we know that we're not always going <laughs> to um, trust the government to tell them our most intimate stories, but it, it is the, um, it is the record that we have, and so I, I was interested in sort of the levels in that sort of people telling their own stories and telling them from memory, um, so that was a huge resource, um, especially those done by Zora Neale Hurston, um, Their Eyes Were Watching God, which again, a huge influence in the, in the novel and the style of my novel that I wanted to tell. Um, and then just uh, archivally, yeah, I um, uh, did a lot of research, a lot of reading, just tried to get really sort of primary sources. Um, again, those first person sort of narratives, those first person um, views and memories of, of slavery as much as was available. Um, I even went to sort of court records, court cases, um, newspapers, diaries, anything that felt very close to, to the personalities of these people and what they, their view of history was. Um, and then as for my grandmother, who um, is from Ghana in West Africa, um, so she is, we say she's a hundred because no one knows she's, <laughs> she's one of those sort of, um, timeless souls who, who loves to sit down and tell you a story. And so I really was inspired by sort of the way that memory and stories are handed down through families. And so I wanted to, to have that sort of storyteller quality, uh, in the novel. 
So you may have already, you probably answered this question already, but Brad Moy wanted to know your research process. Can you share a little bit more in depth about that? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I definitely felt that I didn't have a, a strong um, sort of understanding of, of slavery in American history. I think it's sort of, it was for me personally, just a blind spot that I had sort of the overview, um, but I really wanted to dive into it just out of interest. So when I was in college, I went to NYU. Um, I studied screenwriting, but I also, I always uh, accidentally majored in history because I took every single course that I could um, just out of interest, just wanting to sort of understand, um, you know, Black history and sort of, and find myself there and, and as sort of, sort of a, um, you know, a person who comes from sort of many backgrounds, I wanted to also find these people that were displaced or, or couldn't tell their stories. And so that was just, for me, a personal um, interest. And then I never really expected it to inform a novel, but then <laughs> that's what happens with your obsessions, as Stephanie <laughs> clearly outlined. Um, you know, you can't help sort of exploring those things. And, and one of the most memorable experiences for me um, again, was going to West Africa and Ghana, and I went to a slave castle, so a former slave castle, um, on the on the coast where uh, Ghanaians or Africans in general, because it was sort of a gate, um, were taken, and it was sort of the last place, the last portion of their home that they saw before they got in these boats. Um, as you see in the the excerpts I read, um, it was sort of the last bit of of safety that they had and so going there for me personally and just sort of um, returning to my personal history my you know family history and returning to this place that these people never got to return to again was such an informative such an informative and painful and complex thing that I was like how can I embody that in a novel and so that was also a very important part of the process so research I think surprises you <laughs> sometimes how it, it sort of becomes uh, personal and complex in the way it informs, informs what you end up writing. Thank you. Both of you take us to such magical places. Stephanie, I want to ask you a question. Tell us about your travels and the paintings that you um, have seen and how that helped your research. Oh, gosh. I, um, I uh, went to Italy Time when I was 20, I studied over there for a semester at the University of Pisa, which is about anybody who's been there, it's about 30 to 40 minute train ride from Florence. So I would hop on the train and go to Florence. And that was the first time that I met Michelangelo in person. And then, you know, you go to, I mean, and when I say that, I mean, you like come face to face with the David and all of his work and you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, but then I went down to the Vatican. Uh, so I went down to Rome early on during that trip for the first time. And when you go to the Vatican, it's not just the Sistine. I think everybody sort of motors their way through the Vatican to get to the Sistine. And it is amazing and it is absolutely glorious. But on the way that you're going through there, you are walking through the Raphael rooms. You are walking through these jewel boxes of rooms with these amazing masterpieces in them. And I've talked to people since who've said, oh my gosh, I wish I'd read your book and known what I was walking through. Cause you're walking through the, the Vatican Museum. It's giant by the way. And you're just, you're just one room after another, after another, after another. And it's overwhelming. And so people don't realize the, the iconic pieces that they're walking by and they're not paying attention to just because they're so overwhelmed. Um, so when I was very young and I was in my twenties, first time going to the Vatican and seeing the Raphael rooms which is what I depict him painting in this novel. And then the Transfiguration, which is one of my favorite paintings um, of all times. It's like the, the, it just overpowers you with how could a person, this isn't a photograph, this is a painting. This is in the Raphael rooms, these masterpieces, they're not just like oils on canvas. These are frescoes, these are, paint going into wet plaster on a clock as the plaster's drying and you're trying to apply perfect bits of paint. It's extraordinary when you think about just the, the sheer difficulty of pulling off something like that. And so for me, that's always been the feeling of being face to face with a great masterpiece is how did this person do this? 
Um, I, I, I've been to every museum I can go to and just drooled over paintings and I go back all the time. I, I lived across the street for a year from the um, National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. We had, we had a place there for almost a year. And I would go in almost every day just to walk through this like one room of Raphael's because they're just, it's amazing that a human being can capture that kind of a person and a person's soul on a piece of canvas. That probably did not answer your question, Garbo, but that's my impression of being in front of paintings. I just go all crazy. So Brad Moy wants to know what, um, all your research, what's the one thing you learned that surprised you the most? Um, my problem with Raphael is I had already been obsessed with this material for 25 years. Um, but I will tell you that, that sort of over that 25 years, the one piece that I love is um, uh, there's a woman who plays a prominent part in the, in the uh, plot named Felicia de la Rovere, and she's the illegitimate child of Pope Julius II. And she is one of the fiercest, coolest women on the planet. She's like helping to like bring about peace in Rome. She's a, she's a property owner in her own right. She refuses to get married. Then when she does get married, she marries this like big wig in, in Rome so she can help sort of move chess pieces on behalf of her dad. She is brilliant and fascinating. And I wrote an entire draft of this novel through her point of view. And then I threw it out uh, as, as a few will, will, will understand. Cause you do, you write a lot of stuff that you just toss out. I, she's not an artist and I care about the artistic process. So I just couldn't finish it. But she features such a big part because I got so obsessed with her for a while. That sort of answers Brad's question. It's close. Pope Julius II had an awesome, illegitimate daughter. I think that's sort of cool. Okay. Stephanie, Spencer Jansen wants to know, how much artistic liberty is taken in recounting the history and step in your novel? Oh, every historical novel is with this, right? This is the big question. Um, it's rough. Uh, Leonardo, Leonardo and Michelangelo, who, who were in my first novel, we have so much more information about them. Michelangelo um, wrote a lot of letters. He wrote a lot of poetry. He even basically dictated a, bio, a dictated a biography. Leonardo, I think famously, everybody knows, kept extensive notebooks. Raphael's life is simply not as, as documented. It was 500 years ago. He was not a prolific letter writer. He was not a prolific poet. He didn't live, he only lived to be 37. He didn't live long enough to dictate his own biography like Michelangelo did. We have a couple of primary sources. We have um, Georgia, well, secondary, but they was very early. It was during, right after Raphael's lifetime, a biography was written of him from first person accounts. We have a handful of letters and also a very good friend of Raphael's uh, named Baldassar Castiglione wrote a book called The Courtier. And his ideal courtier was based, legend has it, on Raphael. So that's where I got a lot of his personality ticks. That being said, a lot of the Vatican years are documented in Vatican documents, and we know quite a bit about Michelangelo's time up the Sistine. So everything that I could know, I included and did not deviate from. Uh, there are lots of blank spots, particularly in history that's 500 years old, um, or in Afia's case, that's not as documented. You just don't, they, you just didn't write about, slaves didn't write as much. 500 years ago, we just don't have as many physical documents. There are a lot of blank spaces you have to fill in. That's one of the reasons why I'm a novelist, not a historian, is I want to fill in the dialogue and how it felt to be there and, 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 and what was going through people's heads that you can't get from historical sources. I try very hard to stay as historically accurate as possible. That being said, I do take some liberties for storytelling. I, I like a good plot. As I said, I'll do it. I explain all of it in an author's note. I'm very careful and I'm very meticulous about keeping which parts are right and which parts are wrong. I put it at the end of the book because there are some spoilers though. So be warned. I see you shaking your head. I want to know, what about you and artistic liberty? How do you manage Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely echo everything Stephanie says, especially the part about being a novelist and not a historian. Um, we get to sort of run away with, with what ifs and, and fill in those blanks that, again, that history doesn't have. Um, yeah, so for me, again, I, I took liberties in terms of 
uh, you know, creating my own, my own town that didn't exist, as we talked about earlier, um, and sort of uh, imagining these people. And, and I also was, was taken with what Stephanie said about, um, about sort of making the voice modern and, and respecting that the reader, <laughs> you know, comes, comes with these sort of prejudices of, oh, this person is from 500 years ago. They sound like whatever, and they're irrelevant to me. And so I love that that quality stuff you know, that Inal has um, of, of bringing it to the present. And so I think that is a certain liberty that, that we as novelists get to take and, and should take because I think it, it, brings, it brings what other, the stories that otherwise would have been lost um, to, to us in a new light. So Stephanie, everybody wants to know, do you paint? I did. I, I used to fancy myself a painter um, in college. So when I got my undergraduate degree, I had both an art history degree and a fine arts degree. So you had to at my school, you had to do both if you were going to do one or the other. So I was a painter. Um, and for a hot minute, I remember thinking, oh, this is what I'm going to do for a living. And then I realized I wasn't very good at it. Like I just, I just didn't have that like dexterity and, and the attention to detail that you need to be a great painter. I do still paint sometimes, particularly when I get stressed out. Um, I'll still pick up a brush sometimes um, just as a relief, but I don't, I, I don't have any intentions of being an actual painter. Just hobby. So Melissa McCauley wants to know, Stephanie, do you, did you do research at the Vatican Art? You know, I, I've actually never been asked that. I tried to get into the Vatican once through like an inn and I failed miserably to get the in. Um, I, I probably could work at it harder in order to get in there and get my hands on some fancy stuff. Um, but it's always been um, a complicated uh, uh, ask to be able to actually get in to get my hands on the stuff I would have to get in on. So I've always used reproductions at other libraries. I've been in other uh, ar archives in uh, Rome and in Florence, but I've never made it into the Vatican archive. If you have an in, call me. I'll go and I will get the gloves and I will, I will do all the things I have to do. Okay. There are some questions ending up over in the chat, by the way. Um, so we can scroll or, or people can move them to the Q and A, but there's one for a few that you, uh, about characters. You have such a complex relationship. Can you speak about Rue? Um, yes, yeah, so the question of Rina and Rue's complex relationship. Um, so again, Rue is the midwife and it's sort of a coming of age story about how she, she gets into that position. And Verena's the daughter, the white daughter of um, the plantation owner. Um, and they sort of grow up together and have this sort of complex friendship. Um, and for me, I really wanted to begin with the idea of um, they're sort of, they're, again, the innocence of children, right? But they're sort of just like shared experiences as they're related to each other. So their expectations um, or the expectations that were placed upon them growing up and how those start to differ as they get older. Um, and, and sort of the, the resentment and the, um, the ways that they start to not understand each other as they get older, which I think is a universal, you know, quality of friendship. Um, that I really wanted to explore. And I also didn't want anyone to be sort of the, the, the victim or the villain in the story. So I really wanted to explore um, the ways that, again, expectations sort of form um, who we become and the ways we rail against that. I think Verena in particular is a very sort of uh, forceful character in that she doesn't want to sort of be this genteel, um, sort of a uh, woman that's just going to be married away and yet she has expectations placed on her um and she's also in a position of, of power um over rue that she sometimes uses out of anger um out of her own frustrations and so that's sort of complex um and then rue you know does sort of the same thing where she finds herself in a position over verena um and that comes later in the novel and it's sort of these, what, what, how are 
the expectations that, and the education that you get about who you are as a person, how do they affect your relationships, I guess, is the, is the thing I really wanted to explore um, with those characters. And so they have this, they sort of have a very up and down trajectory um, throughout the novel of, of power dynamics and, and trying to define themselves in a world that is very much determined to define them. Um, it's the short. <laughs> Wait, uh, I have a question for Fia, and since I have a microphone, I'm going to ask it instead of typing. Yeah. So, um, so this is your first, this is your first published, I'm sure like all of us, you have 800 and filing cabinet somewhere. Um, uh, so this is your first published one. Uh, it, it came out in the middle of a pandemic, I'm very sorry. Uh, my second one came out in the middle of a pandemic, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, how has it been and what are you working on next? Are you staying in historical fiction is really what I want to know. Yes, so I love historical fiction. I think you could tell by my my big eyes as you were, <laughs> as you were giving us the rundown that I just love these stories. Like, I mean, they're stories. They're it's storytelling, and I love um, hearing about different time periods and and the way their their lives turned out just based on you know uh, little events, right, and big events. Um, so right now I'm working on. Uh, a Harlem Renaissance novel. Um, so it's a little bit more snappy. It's a little bit more, <laughs> um, uh, it's it's sort of a thriller. It's a bit of a mystery. Um, yeah, and I'm picking away at that. So it has a similar sort of magical realism bent, but it also is, it's a little bit more fast paced, which, which I'm having fun with. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to see how that comes out. What about you, book three? Uh, yeah, I'm still doing I'm great historical fiction until I, like, pass away at some point late in life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I'm just obsessed. Uh, I, I'm leaving the Italian now. Um, I'll be back, I guess, at some point. But um, for now, I'm leaving Niagara and going to the country. Um, so that's about all you get at this point. I'm not saying much more than that yet. You know, it's early on. It's, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm late. I've already written a draft. I take forever to write. These are like, these are like four years of work. I churned out television for five nights a week, almost 20 years. So now that I'm uh, uh, writing novels, I'm taking my sweet time to write them. That's what I want to do with them. Can I ask Stephanie a question? <laughs> The time we're just we're just running rough shot over the Q and A, but I wanted to. I love the sort of like monologue quality of of the novel, and I wanted to know how much as as someone who also has sort of a screenwriting background and and fought with my narrative <laughs> against that. How did that sort of how did that affect your writing? Do you think, especially in this? Um, you know, the the first one's not like that at all. The first one's third person, limited, bounces back and forth between Michelangelo and Leonardo. And I thought this one would be the same. I thought it would be Michelangelo versus Raphael, same thing. And the voice wouldn't shut up. The, it just, he just wouldn't stop talking. And I'm, taking act, and I'm taking acting, I've been taking acting classes for about seven years now. And so I am convinced that part of that voice, part of that character voice started getting into my head and started, um, but he just wouldn't stop talking. I couldn't stop him. He was like, hello, I, can you give this to me, please? Um, it ended up being a lot of fun, and I'm I'm back to uh, third person limited, um, a, a couple points of view. So I've gotten away, and I sort of miss it. I sort of miss the 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 voice and the and the person talking and the asides. You know, it's sort of fun to write, and that's totally a, a screenwriter background. Hold on, there's one more in in, in the chat. I thought there would be more. Yeah, awesome. yeah, awesome. One from Melissa McCauley. She wants to know who's the father of Marina's baby. And then Emmy Cubitt wants to say that secrets play such an important role in the plot. How did you decide to use this as a plot driver? So you could probably weave both answers into that. Uh, well, that's Maybe. huge. That's a huge spoiler. I will say, <laughs> um, I love, I love sort of letting the reader um, create their own conspiracies. And so I think that, <laughs> I think there's a few different threads that you can follow um, regarding Verena. I think um, there are a few hints of who it might be, and I think ultimately Rue doesn't know, and Rue is sort of 
again, the, the lens through which we see things. And so I don't think there's a definitive answer. I think we'll never know. <laughs> but I think there's a few strong uh, conspiracies that, that you could follow um, on, on either side of the plantation, I will say. <laughs> Yeah, and, and sorry, what was the other part of the question? Secrets play such an important role in the plot. How did you decide to use the plot driver? Oh, I just love, and again, screenwriting, I think just the twists. I just really, even though it was a heavy topic, it's a, a lot of history, I really just wanted a lot of juicy twists and turns, as you can tell. Um, I just, I just wanted those, like, who's the, who's the father of the baby? Those kinds of twists are just... I, I think you should always sneak those in, no matter how uh, <laughs> how literary you want to be. I think that's an important part of storytelling, and so for me, that's just that's what I love. So it was it was always going to be secrets, right? See, Hollywood does get it right sometimes. Oh, we, we know how to do a plot, people. We have about five minutes before. left. We have about five minutes left. I want to remind you that you can get both of these books at the festival's website and at Wordsworth Books. Uh, so I want to give Stephanie some last, you know, last comments before we leave. Anything you want to share? Last comments? I don't know. This has been fun. Oh, I do have two things. In the Kindle version, so of course hardcover is great. Also in the Kindle version, there are links. I put in links to all the artwork. So that's fun. So you can just directly go. Although you should definitely buy the hardcover from them. Oh, and I'm going to invite you on my show, Afia, because I do a YouTube talk show where I interview other writers. And because I've been a talk show producer for 20 years, and then I edit them and then I put them up and share them. So I'm going to invite you, and then we'll have another conversation. It'll be fun. So everybody, tune in to Team Story to see my show where I talk to other writers all the time. That's what I know. Fabulous, fabulous. Okay, Afia. Hooray, uh, that would be awesome. You can tell how much fun I'm having. So that would be so great to extend that. Um, but yeah, Conjure Women, um, new out during the pandemic, find it. Um, I will say, I think the audiobook is a lot of fun. So check that out too, if you guys prefer to listen that way. Um, the voice actor is Adinrelli Ojo and she does an amazing, amazing job. She does all sorts of different voices um, and really brings it to life in a way that also uh, and captures sort of the screenwriting background that I do have. So, yes, <laughs> Andrew, and then check it out. Well, I can tell you, it's being like in the best of both worlds, being a gallerist and a bookseller. I mean, you couldn't ask to be a moderator for a better uh, set of authors. So, thank you both for being virtually with us and staying uh, on point as you do what you do. We really appreciate you. And thank you to all the people who have, who have participated. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the book festival because it goes on through the 18th. So follow the schedule and participate. So let's give everybody a hand. Yay! Thanks everybody for coming. Virtual hug. Thank you, Garbo. Thank you. Thank you, Garbo. Next time we'll do it in person. Definitely. And you're in Hot Springs. When you come to Little Rock, you have to stop by the bookstore. Okay. I, right. we, we, we will be sheltering in place as long as we shelter in place here. Then we'll be out. Crazy. <laughs> and I got to thank Stuart, the Zoom squad. He's been fabulous to make everything go fabulous. So thank you to Brad, the whole festival, everybody that's made this possible. We really appreciate you. All right. Take Bye. care. Bye. Everybody says thank you. So I think it went Yay. well. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, take care. All right. I think technically we have minutes left. I don't know if people are going to sit here and just watch us go. I don't know what happens. I don't know what happens. We just leave the room, but you know, thank you, ladies. It was so engaging and so much fun. I think, you know, I think everybody will read this book, both books, and who started something. Historical fiction is going to take the up. Uh.